Hello and welcome to HIVRNA Test Guide Podcast, your trusted source for HIV testing, with over 4,500 plus testing labs across the United States. Imagine this, a shield against HIV, over 99.9% .9 effective. And all it takes is uh, just two simple injections a year. That's what we're diving into today. It's this medical breakthrough, really, offering six months of protection from just one shot. It's uh, it's pretty hard to overstate how big a deal that is. I mean, for decades, the challenge wasn't just making something effective. It was making something that people could actually use in their real lives. Right. Linux Apophir seems to be that. But, you know, the, the really amazing story here is how the global community pulled off this huge economic shift to, well, make it affordable for almost everyone. Absolutely. We've got sources here covering, well, one of the biggest steps forward in the HIV fight. We're looking at the science of this six-month shot, how it got through regulations so fast, surprisingly fast, and then the story of how a coalition basically crashed the price from, what, over $28,000 a year down to just $40. It's quite a story of global teamwork. Okay, let's unpack this for you. I think we need to start with um, what came before, you know, why lenacapavir was even needed. We already had effective prevention, like daily P pre-P pills, why weren't they enough? Yeah, that's really the essential backdrop. Pre-P, pre-exposure prophylaxis, mm. uh, drugs like Truvada, they've been central to prevention for, gosh, over 10 years now. And look, if you take them perfectly every single day, they work incredibly well. But that's the catch, isn't it? Taken perfectly. That's the whole challenge. The effectiveness of a daily pill, it just plummets the moment someone misses doses. And sticking to it perfectly, while that's often derailed by things that aren't medical at all. Like stig stigma is huge, absolutely, number one. I mean, if you're in a place where needing pre-AP could lead to, I don't know, violence or being cast out, well, hiding your pills or just the stress of it all, it makes forgetting doses almost inevitable for some people. And then you add on top of that the sort of practical stuff like inconsistent supplies, maybe having to travel miles to a clinic or just running out of pills if you're somewhere remote. That daily need becomes this this massive barrier, especially if you're trying to stop an epidemic globally. Exactly. That need for perfect daily lifelong adherence. It created this really critical gap, almost impossible to bridge completely in many prevention efforts. Huh. So Lenacopavir, or yes to go the brand name, it was specifically designed to get rid of that gap, to just remove the daily burden altogether. Okay, so let's get into the solution itself, Lena Copperveer. What makes it work so differently from the daily pills that it can actually last for six months? Well, what's fascinating here is the mechanism. It's a whole new class of drug, actually. Older treatments, they mostly mess with the enzymes HIV uses to copy itself, right? This one is different. It's a capsid inhibitor. Okay, capsid inhibitor. What does that actually mean for someone listening? So, um... Think of the HIV virus like this little package trying to get its instructions inside a healthy cell. Hmm. That package has a protective shell made of protein. That's the capsid. Got it. A capsid inhibitor basically, well, it locks down that shell. It stops the virus from putting its core structure together correctly. So it's blocking it really, really early in its life cycle, like stopping it before it even gets properly started inside the cell. Ah, so it hits the process much earlier and maybe more fundamentally than the older drugs. That sounds like it would be key to making it last longer. It is. And that mechanism is what allows for this incredible dosing schedule. Mm. The real game changer is the simplicity. One subcutaneous injection uh, just twice a year. Wow. And the clinical trials showed effectiveness over 99.9% .9 in stopping new infections, which you know really sets a new standard. It's probably the most powerful prevention tool we've ever seen, efficacy-wise. From a public health view, that combination, near-perfect effectiveness and just twice a year dosing it just changes everything for logistics, doesn't it? You're managing someone's care twice a year instead of trying to track 365 bays of pills. The reduction in burden, both for the system and for the person, it's just huge. It really is. A breakthrough like this, it needs quick action. And looking at our sources, it seems like the regulators really stepped up. How fast has this been adopted globally? The speed has been pretty remarkable, actually which tells you how clear the need was. So in the U.S., the FDA already approved it for prevention in adults and adolescents uh, weighing at least 35 kilos. And that makes it the first and still the only two-shot-a-year prevention option there. And what about internationally? Usually that U.S. approval helps speed things up elsewhere. It definitely did. Mm. The WHO, the World Health Organization, they, they issued a really strong recommendation for injectable lenacapavir as another prevention choice. 
And WHO guidelines, they're hugely influential. Mm. You know, they often shape how countries, especially in Africa and Asia, update their own health policies. Mm. And then in Europe, the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, they also moved fast, gave it a positive opinion under an accelerated review. So, yeah, the signals are pretty much green across the board. But OK, speed and effectiveness are one thing. But they don't mean much if the price puts it totally out of reach for the people who need it most. And this this is where the story takes a really dramatic turn. Here's where it gets really interesting. When Gilead first launched Lena Capavir in the U.S., the price was, well, staggering. Can you tell us but, about that initial cost and how it basically locked the drug out of low and middle income countries? Yeah, the initial price was uh, over twenty eight thousand dollars per patient per year. Now, in rich countries, insurance, public health systems, they kind of absorb that. But for what, 120 low and middle income countries, $28,000 is just, <laughs> it's in impossible, an absolute wall. The science was ready, but the economics meant it was totally inaccessible for the populations most at risk. Just couldn't happen. Couldn't happen. Yeah. Which is why this turning point in 2025 is so incredibly important. It wasn't about new science. It was this massive political and financial move pushed by a coalition of global health organizations. What kind of coalition is powerful enough to basically force down a $28,000 price tag? Well, you had the major players in global health equity involved, you know, the Gates Foundation, Unitaid, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, the Global Fund. Basically, they pooled their influence, their negotiating power. Their leverage. Exactly, their collective leverage. Yeah. And they successfully negotiated with Gilead to allow generic versions to be made. So Gilead then partnered up with two big Indian generic manufacturers, Dr. Reddy's Labs and Hetero. And that licensing deal, that's the key piece that allows for the, well, the unbelievable price drop we're seeing. And the result of that deal is, that's mind blowing. Yeah. Instead of $28,000 a year, the generic cost is expected to be just $40 per patient, per year. I just. I have to pause on that. $40 a year. Thinking about where things were even five years ago, what does that number really tell us about the power that a unified global health front can actually wield? It tells us that when the effectiveness is crystal clear mm. and the human need is just undeniable, these big organizations can use their influence, their purchasing power, to essentially force open market access. It changes the whole conversation, you know, from being all about patents and profits to being about public health necessity. Yeah. And it's a this watershed moment. It's projected to make Lena Capivir available in those 120 low and middle income countries probably by 2027. So if we connect this to the bigger picture, $40 a year for almost perfect prevention, that just fundamentally redraws the map of the epidemic, doesn't it? Especially in places like Africa and Asia, where that prevention gap has been the widest. It's exactly right. This is strategically aimed at the groups who need it most, but have the hardest time with daily pills. We're talking about adolescent girls, young women, men who have sex with men, sex workers, groups facing the highest infection rates. This price drop means a scientific miracle might actually be deployed on the scale needed to make a real public health difference. This access is phenomenal. But OK, solving the money problem, that just gets us to the next phase, right? Which might be even harder actually rolling it out. Even with the cost sorted, success isn't guaranteed. What are the really critical hurdles of practical challenges health workers are facing now? The absolute biggest one, the medical requirement we just cannot compromise on, is testing. And this raises an important question. What happens if someone who is already HIV positive, but they don't know it, they get this six-month injection. That's the nightmare scenario, isn't it? Resistance. It's the single biggest danger. If someone with an existing untreated infection gets Lena Capivir, the virus could develop resistance to it incredibly quickly. Which would ruin our best new tool. Precisely. It could neutralize this amazing prevention method before it even gets widely used. So the absolute rule, the precondition for starting Lena Capivir pre-EP, has to be a confirmed negative HIV test. Hmm. And crucially, not just the rapid finger prick tests that are common now, we often need reliable lab tests, sometimes even the more sensitive HIV RNA tests, to make sure we catch very recent infections before giving the shot. Wow. OK, so the biggest immediate challenge isn't actually delivering the drug itself. It's building and maintaining really reliable, fairly sophisticated, high volume testing systems across 120 countries, many of which might struggle with things like consistent electricity or trained lab staff. That is the hard reality. And beyond that huge testing hurdle, you've still got massive logistical challenges. I mean, training thousands of healthcare workers, many in very remote clinics on how to give these injections correctly. 
mm -hmm. storing the drug properly, making sure the supply chains are absolutely foolproof. Because even twice a year, if there's a disruption, that's a six-month gap in protection. And what about the policy side? You mentioned 120 low- and middle-income countries getting the generic deal. But what about those countries sort of stuck in the middle, the middle-income ones that might not qualify? Yeah, that's a really significant gap in the policy. You have these um, upper-middle-income countries. They're not classified as poor, but affording the full price is still a massive struggle for their health budgets. Yet, they're often excluded from these generic licensing deals. No, they're caught. They're caught, stuck between the $28,000 reality and the $40 possibility. It creates real budget problems for protecting their own high-risk groups. And then on top of that, governments everywhere need to update their official guidelines. They need to actually budget for this. And they need to invest seriously in awareness campaigns, building trust, creating demand, especially in communities that might be wary of new medical stuff. So bringing it all together, this mix of almost perfect efficacy and this radical new affordability. It really does feel like the closest we've ever been to a tool that could genuinely help end new infections globally. So what does this all mean for, say, the next five years? Well, it means we've cleared the science hurdle. And largely, we've cleared the financial hurdle, which is amazing. Yeah. So the focus now shifts entirely. It's yeah. not about medical invention anymore. It's about implementation. It's about logistics. Right. The political will, the sheer effort required to make sure that the essential pre-screening, that robust testing infrastructure is actually built, maintained, and kept running in 120 different countries mm -hmm. before this drug gets rolled out widely. That's going to decide everything. So in other words, the money barrier might be broken, but the real victory, the true global health win, it doesn't hinge on the drug itself anymore. It hinges on whether we can actually build the capacity to safely test millions and millions of people, especially in communities that have always been the hardest to reach. That's the next huge mountain to climb. 